What are the differences in the fighting philosophy of 133 and the Bolognese sources? Hello there, Martin here from Schildwache Potsdam and today I would like to talk about Sword and Buckler with you. So 133 is by far the most popular system to practice Sword and Buckler, but most often it's fairly contested or let's say the interpretations of 133 are fairly contested and with this video I would like to share my personal perspective on the system and how it compares to the Bolognese sources. So if you didn't know, I actually started my journey in HEMA with 133, which is quite a few years ago, and I, and I still practice Sword and Buckler uh, with the 133 or the Fecht 1, which it's actually called now uh, st uh, still today. So, okay. What's the fighting philosophy of 133 broken down? Well, in its most basic sense, 133 compare, uh, consists of wards, so positions, and counter positions, obsessio. So, uh, sieges to these positions, which then um, enable the besieger to develop an advantage, which I then usually use to get into a position where they can hit without getting hit, like all martial arts uh, really should stray, uh, strive for. So we have positions, counter positions, and how to move into these counter positions and use that advantage to drive our hit home. And that's usually done in a binding situation. So there are actually a few uh, situations in the 133 where we are told to like uh, hit directly from our counter ward uh, to the opponent if they uh, omit to react and then we are told to not hesitate and to strike them but most often of the time uh, most often times they react accordingly they engage in a bind they displace or blow or anything like that and then we get into the binding situations and some uh, fighting context. So, and we are also taught that the seven positions, so there are seven positions in 133, under the arm, over the shoulders, over the head, on the, uh, on the side, to the breast and up front, the lung out, that these positions are basically the ordering of strikes or blows, uh, plyum they use, which can be thrusts or, st uh, thrusts or strikes. And that at least indicates that each position is like an idealized uh, form for a strike. Or maybe you could think of it like every position has a most direct strike or a most direct attack it can perform, which is therefore the most likely or Let's say it's uh, the optimal path or the fastest path to the opponent, which doesn't necessarily mean that you can't strike other attacks from that position. Okay, so you have wards, you have counter wards, and you have uh, positions that determine strikes. All right, so how is it in the Bolognese sources? Well, in the Bolognese sources, you have, again, a lot of positions which are way more numerous than the ones in the uh, 133 because they distinguish all kinds of positions depending on where the point of your sword is, where the hand is, how your feet are aligned and all, kind, uh, all this. But um, to make a parallel to 133, they also say that all attacks, all actions lie between two positions or two guards, which means if you, for example, want to strike a descending blow from your right, you go into Guardia Alta, so a high guard, and then strike to Borte di Ferro, which is a guard on your inside, for example. That would uh, describe a Mandrito, so for right hand, that would be a blow from the right. Okay. So you once again have positions and these determine uh, attacks 
And then you have, in the fighting philosophy of the Bolognese sources, you have provocations. Okay? And provocations are, or the provocations' purposes are, to attack your opponent in a safe manner. To either get an advantage of position or of timing. Okay, so these provocations, they could be feints, they could be uh, real attacks. These could be just movements to gain such an advantage. And if you combine this with the knowledge that each attack is uh, framed by basically two positions, then once again, in the Bolognese sources, you go from any position to a counter position via an attack or a provocation to then abuse that advantage until the end, until you strike your opponent without getting struck. So this makes the sources already really, really similar. And I think that shouldn't be underestimated. One further note is that Morozzo actually gives us a counter posture drill. Like he says, if your opponent has this posture, then you transition to this. If they go then into that posture, you transition and so on, which just underlies the fact that it's still a posture and counter posture system where you, uh, where you are striving to gain an advantage in timing, measure and position. Okay, so what are the differences between the two systems? Well, for once, of course, preferred actions uh, are different, which can be explained by the preferences of the different authors, because then again, uh, between the different Bolognese sources, the preferred actions also differ quite a bit. So it would only be natural for 133 to prefer different actions than the ones out of the Bolognese sources. But then again, we see like a tendency in the manual 133 to go for situations where we have like a bind or at least some kind of close play. Where in the Bolognese sources, there's at least uh, as well an emphasis on the white play as well. So we have Gioco Stretto and Gioco Lago so the wide and the close play, which um, basically just means Giacolago where the points are not in presence, where you have like strikes to the blade and also to the opponent, but you again exit out of measure, where in Gioco Stretto you are basically at the mezzo spada, which is literally at the half sword, so the, uh, the swords cross at around the halfway point, so you are already quite close. And from there, you have to act really fast. You have to be sharp in the mind. They also emphasize that to uh, gain the initiative and to place your actions in a meaningful manner. Okay. So while 133, it's basically all Gioco Stretto and the Bolognese sources, you also have the white play. And maybe therefore uh, a little bit of uh, less emphasis on the close play. But then again, they emphasize that in the strata there lies like the whole art, which is something that resonates very well with 133, where they say that all the art lies in the seventh ward, which is lang ward, and all the actions from the other wards should end in that uh, position, which is then something that would go with the late in present. So once again, Giacomo Stretto. So why said, why do the Bolognese sources also focus on the white play? Actually, uh, Giovanni Dalla Gocchia might give us a hint why that is. For once, um, white play is beautiful. And you have to keep in mind that these were fencing masters that also tried to sell a product. And, it, uh, and it's much easier to sell a product if it's attractive or sexy uh, to the ones you are selling it to. So if students think that your cell play is like really beautiful, then it's way easier to um, make them going to your school to teach them that sword play. Okay, and they also say 
uh, some people that are like not introduced into the art of sword play, they don't really appreciate the strata. So they, for example, Marozzo gives us several drills where he just uh, uses Giacolago or if someone is already initiated into the art of sword play, then he mixes it up where the Giacolago and the Giacostretto goes for the binding situations, goes for the play at the mezza spada, so at the half sword. So um, he can mix it up according to the needs of the actual students. Another point that Manciolino and actually Vigiani gave us is that in fencing with sharp blades and in earnest, all the parries and actions are probably a bit wider. Why? Well, because if you think about it, there's coming a sharp blade towards your face, then you don't go for the parries that are, um, that are meant in a way that they displace the opponent's blade just out of the side of your head to get your own counter in, but more probably you want to be a little bit safer. You have also the adrenaline of the fight, so all your motions are a bit like uh, less refined and you will go for bigger motions, which uh, then again is something you should practice as well with blunt weapons. So if you go for a few bigger motions there, that also leave you safe, then you will be more adept to use that in a high pressure situation like a sword fight in earnest as well. That's also another point I would like to make and it's something that Marozzo actually mentions in the play with the two-handed sword where he goes like um, the sword is like rising and falling from position to position and then he talks about like striking the opponent while they are rising and falling because that would be a tempo where they couldn't react other than a very in a very predictable way. So why should they uh, rise and fall with the sword or why should they embellish the play with like unnecessary movements if they are out of measure? Well, Marozzo talks about it in the next uh, in the next chapter or in the next paragraph when he says that it disguises your actual intentions. So if we think about it again, uh, the basic concept, moving from a ward to a counter ward position or po uh, postures and counter postures, then it's actually for people that are initiated in the art, should be fairly easy to react to every of your motion with like a counter motion. Okay, but if you're like really out of measure and you're already beginning to play that game by making it unpredictable in what counter position or in what position you will end, then it gets way harder. So it's basically disguising your true intentions like a magician applying the sly of hands, all right? So you're not actually trying to do these unnecessary motions with a measure because that would be foolish, that would present tempi, so opportunities to attack for your opponent, but you're doing these out of measures, out of measure to disguise your true intention and if you have like a crowd to also please them to show off your good swordsmanship uh, to display that you're an honorable and worthy opponent, which shouldn't be underestimated because uh, violence is also a social construct. Okay, so going into a duel, it's not only about winning with a hit, but it's also everything around us. So displaying good uh, sportsmanship, uh, being honorable, all that stuff is important as well. Okay, so if we have wide play and narrow play, how do we deal with opponents that play either only in the wide and only in the narrow? Well, in the Anonymous, we get some really good advice, which is if the opponent only knows wide or narrow play and you know both, how to approach the fight. So if they only play in the narrow play, which usually uh, always trumps the white play, then you should act as if you would 
fight them in the narrow play as well, but then hit them with an action in white play. All right. So, for example, if they uh, face you with a point forward guard, you should engage in the binding play, try to threaten them, and then go out of the bind to then strike them behind the blade, to the legs, or anything like that. That would be the advice of the Ananimo. And if they are in the white play, you usually want to make them uh, get their blade into your presence once again to then displace it. So if they are only um, playing in the white play, you should uh, pretend to play in the white play as well, but then in the opportune moment strike them in the narrow play. All right? Because, and that's something Marozzo also, uh, also tells us, if they only know in, uh, to play in the white play, then they would usually be forced to flee from you all the time. Because you could seek the bind, or these like little micro binds between two blows, to then press them further, get your advantage, go in with their really with these really narrow motions to then strike them without getting struck. Okay, so let's conclude our thoughts about the fighting philosophy of 133 versus the Bolognese sources. So the basic fighting philosophy is strikingly similar actually, because they are both basically systems where we have postures and counter postures to get an advantage in position, in timing and in measure as well, to then abuse that advantage until the end, until you can hit your opponents without getting struck yourself, which is something all martial arts once again should strive for. The preferred actions differ. So for example, seeing a crooke in Bolognese sources would be like really strange. But then again, this could be just individual preferences, maybe some preferences due to the context, so the used blades, the used armor in that time, all, that th all these things still, of course, matter. But you should keep in mind that the spada, the sword used in the Bologna sources could vary quite a bit as well. So I wouldn't uh, count on that factor too much, actually. And the last part I wanted, uh, the last point I wanted to make is that in the 133 it focuses mainly on the Giacostretto, so on the narrow play, where in the Bolognese sources we also get the white play, and maybe a little bit less of an emphasis on the stretto. So um, just talking in ink and actions, the 133 would be a bit more detailed there, for example, but then again, Gioco Stretto is really the heart of the art in the Bolognese sources as well and shouldn't be underestimated. And I think both practitioners could learn a lot if they just looked at the sources from each other and like really get to an exchange of opinions and an exchange within fencing as well. Okay, so I hope you liked this video as a small comparison. Remember to like and subscribe. You can also support us on Patreon. We are really appreciative of our, all of our supporters. Thank you once again. Take care and ciao.